Hello, Sales Nation. I'm your host, Will Barron. Welcome to another episode of the Salesman Podcast. On this episode, we have Roger Dooley, and we're talking about neuro selling. So this is selling to the deeper, subconscious, emotional side of your prospects, and that is where you want to be. If you're selling on the analytical side of things, features, benefits, it's very easy for the competition to come in and say, well, look, our features and benefits uh, very similar, if not better in this case, this case, in this case, and you don't have much influence there. Roger himself is a speaker, an author of Brainfluence, an uh, excellent book, highly recommend it. You can find out more about him over at rogerdooley.com, over at neurosciencemarketing.com, and in the show notes of this episode over at salesman.red forward slash 122. Just before we jump into the show, make sure if you use Facebook that you're part of the Salesman Podcast Facebook group, you can join completely free and have a conversation with the rest of Sales Nation. Some really good questions have been thrown about in there recently, and um, I'm looking to encourage you guys to connect and to just, you know, help build the community between all of us rather than me just pushing out information. There's a lot of knowledge to to be shared within Sales Nation, so you can join the uh, by searching Salesman Podcast Group on Facebook or just go to salesman.red forward slash group and you can jump in there super easily. So with all that said, let's jump in to today's episode. Hey, Roger, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Well, it's great to be here, Will. Good stuff. I'm excited. I've just had to cut our pre-call, uh, pre-recording uh, conversation short because you were diving into what I wanted to dive into and I want it to be all fresh when we're, when we're having this conversation because what we're talking about today, I find it genuinely super interesting. I get the concepts behind it. I don't understand how it works, why it works. Um, and that is selling to emotions rather than selling logically, which I think is what most salespeople do. My experience in medical device sales, it's what I did and it, only in hindsight, looking back, I can see that it's probably not the best way to go about it. And I know you deal with marketers primarily, but obviously marketers are trying to sell a product as well. But the first place to set the tone uh, of the interview and to put things in perspective, do you think that the world of business in general sells to emotions well? Or do you think that everyone, the majority of people are trying to sell logically? I think that we all tend to fall back in that logical uh, sales process uh, because we're comfortable in it. We, it's easy to talk about a product's features, the customer benefits, the price, discounts, and you know, terms. All these things uh, are uh, logical. They're left-brained, if you will. They are uh, conscious uh, motivators, as I would call them. And really, it's, it's not even just emotion. Uh, I think that uh, we discount the effects of the non-conscious uh, neuroscientists have different numbers, but what I use is uh, that 95% of our brain's decision-making processes are non-conscious. Uh, and when you're focused just on features and benefits and price, uh, you are dealing with a very small part of your customer's brain. And uh, the uh, emotions are certainly one aspect of that, uh, but there are all uh, kinds of different things, uh, cognitive biases uh, that affect uh, the way we view information, for example, it's simply uh, uh, due to the way it's presented. Uh, so expressing something in terms of a loss uh, in one situation might be more powerful than saying the exact same thing, but expressing it in terms of a gain uh, and so on. Uh, there are even uh, things like uh, uh, cognitive depletion that uh, and I, I've got some great let, examples. Let me interview you, here, Roger, because we're going to, I want to start from the very basics because I, I think that we're going to get pretty deep pretty quickly here. And it's going to be fascinating, I know. But where yeah, I, I want to start, <laughs> where, where, where I want to start with this for people who, uh, you know, haven't read your book, uh, perhaps not as into the psychology of sales. What or how do you describe the conscious and the subconscious or unconscious? Because you, you threw them out there then. I, without looking in a dictionary or you know, online, couldn't really define them, I, I don't think, off the top of my head. So I guess that's probably the best place to start. Sure. And uh, there's one other way we can characterize them, too. Uh, uh, and that is, as Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winner, has uh, by talking about system one and system two thinking. Uh, and uh, system one thinking is uh, fast, it's intuitive, it's emotional, uh, it's rule-based, uh, and it's very energy efficient for our brain. Uh, system two is what we think about when we talk about thinking about a problem. It's a, a sort of 
of finding through it logically, uh, adding up pluses and minuses and, and that sort of thing. And uh, one of Kahneman key insights is that our brains are fundamentally lazy. They want to conserve energy. They already consume a greatly outside portion of our body's energy, uh, and therefore our bodies will always try and default to, to one thinking when possible. And when you are uh, talking about uh, very logical selling points, for example, to a customer, you're forcing them into this system two thinking, uh, that's probably not very I and mean, their brain is saying, hey, uh, I want to get out of this. This, this is hard work. Uh, uh, that, you know, that's a, yet another way of looking at it. But, but fundamentally, uh, the distinction that I make is conscious. You know, that's that sort of a logical thought process where we are aware that we're thinking about something and aware of how we're making a decision, or at least we think we're aware of it. Uh, and then the non-conscious part is all that stuff that goes into uh, a decision that we may or may not be uh, really aware of. And in many cases, we're not. To, again, put this in perspective, sure, and this is a massive generalization. Um, I, I appreciate that. But for a salesperson to be successful, and again, talking in general terms, should they be skilled at getting in front of and influencing the conscious, subconscious, uh, so system one, system two, or do you need a mixture of both? Does does a buying decision happen in one or the other, or does that depend on you know how much the product is and all that kind of thing as well? Right. Well, I would say that particularly in B two B decisions, uh, there uh, both elements have to be present. Uh, I mean, if you're selling, say, a fragrance or uh, a scotch. Uh, it's really mostly uh, an emotional, a non-conscious decision. Somehow that brand image uh, fits your perception of you and how you might want other people to view you mm -hmm. and so on. Uh, so, uh, but in a B2B market, uh, more often a product has to perform in a certain way to be acceptable. In other words, uh, it's probably solving some kind of a business problem. It's a raw material, uh, a piece of equipment, or uh, a kind of supply that has to do some kind of a job within the business. Uh, and uh, so there's there's going to be that logical piece to it where it has to work. It presumably has to be uh, as good as what competitors are offering. Uh, the, uh, the non conscious piece really comes into uh, play when you have perhaps uh, several competitors offering largely similar products. Uh, the the decision then uh, may well flip into the more non-conscious side. Uh, there may be a trust factor. Uh, there may be a, a, a brand uh, loyalty factor. Uh, there could be uh, a feeling that if I make this decision, uh, this will work out better for me personally. Uh, there's the classic example that uh, probably isn't true anymore. Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. And indeed, uh, you would... Uh, certainly totally justify your purchase of an IBM computer system back in those days uh, based on very logical criteria that, yes, this is going to solve well, whatever problem it's supposed to. Uh, but the underlying current almost certain was, uh, you know, even if this project heads south, uh, I, I'm not going to get fired because mm -hmm. I bought IBM. Uh, you know, what else could I do? Well, uh, a more modern, I, uh, sorry to interrupt, a more modern example of that, just to iterate that point. So I've worked for the two biggest endoscope companies. I've worked for both of them in the past in sales. Uh, Olympus do really well and basically dominate the market in uh, colonoscopes, gastroscopes, the, the big mm -hmm. uh, flexible endoscopes. And that is basically the sales process is what you just described of the such an industry standard. Doctors are, are surgeons are trained on them for a very young age. That if you don't want to rock the boat, if you if the budget's physically there and you or you can do anything in your power to get the budget, they will just always go with Olympus. So that's so that's the the con no yeah so that's the exactly. conscious the same side of kind of problem uh -huh. uh, because uh, if there is a challenger in that market, uh, they can come out with better specifications, a mm -hmm. lower cost, uh, and maybe some nifty features. Uh, but if they don't satisfy that. Uh, I, you know, I'm not going to get uh, fired for buying this, uh, then they probably haven't won at all. And that's, that's often overlooked in the B2B context because, uh, you know, it seems like such a 
full type of purchase, but it often isn't. Okay, so let's dive into this a bit deeper then. Is there a step-by-step process in which decisions are made? Because it seems like you have to, because your brain's being lazy, as you alluded to then, you have to, or it's going to do all the shortcuts it can in that, uh, just to use that endoscope example, Olympus do this, do this, everyone uses them, everyone's trained on them, we should probably go with them. That's the initial decision before, uh, and it's a powerful one if you're a sales rep for Olympus, it's a very disempowering one and a a troubling situation to be in if you're anyone else. Is that what's happening in the brain's decision-making process that it ticks all these boxes uh... first? Uh, and, you know, I think that in that uh, sort of challenger versus incumbent situation, uh, one uh, study that I really love was conducted on um, parole judges. Uh, these parole judges uh, interviewed or they, they saw uh, pre before them all, all day. They, they went for uh, eight hours of uh, getting people's uh, stories of why they should be released from prison. And that's a fairly high stakes for a judge because uh, if you let somebody out and they end up uh, committing another crime or killing somebody, God forbid, uh, then people will immediately turn to you and say, why did you let that person go? You know, you're just terrible and so on. Uh, so for them, it's not an easy decision to make. On the other hand, it's a relatively easy decision to just say no uh, to keep jail because the only really unhappy with that is the prisoner and there's, there's no risk to the judge there. Mm-hmm. So It's um, a uh, kind of a lopsided decision-making process uh, and uh, has some parallels to the uh, uh, incumbent product versus uh, the challenger product, uh, where the challenger might be better, but it's it's a sort of a higher risk decision. And uh, what, uh, when uh, behavior researchers researched thousands and thousands of these decisions, they discovered a really strange pattern. What they found was first thing in the morning, uh, the judges released about two thirds of the prisoners that came before them. And then this declined uh, through the course of uh, the day until right before uh, nearly zero, they were releasing almost nobody. And then after a break, up again, but then continued to decline until the end of the day. And at first they were uh, perplexed by what was going on. They went back and checked their data uh, because this was such a bizarre pattern. It didn't make sense. And and finally, uh, what they did was that it was a case of cognitive depletion that uh, as the judges went through the morning, their uh, resources were being depleted. Uh, They were getting tired. And uh, the more uh, tired they got, the harder it was for them to focus. Uh, the more likely we're to take the easy way out and just say no. So uh, the implication for people selling products is uh, if you are the product where you have to uh, perhaps unseat a competitor that's currently in there, uh, then you want to, that's going to be a, probably a difficult decision for your uh, I worked with a, a big group of IT sellers uh, and they would often want to come in and change, say, customers' software, their storage, or their security systems, and so on. Uh, and this is obviously something that's uh, kind of risky. It's, it takes a lot of work. Uh, there's training involved. There's some uh, risk that it won't work out at all. It'll be a disaster. Uh, so uh, the it's the same kind of uh, uh, problem. And so if you are the uh, challenger, you have to get your cust- customer to make this somewhat risky decision. You want to get them fresh first thing in the morning or perhaps first thing after lunch. Uh, on the other hand, uh, if you're the incumbent, say that uh, that Olympus or that IBM salesperson needs to get a uh, an okay to keep on doing it, uh, uh, it's counterintuitively the, uh, the best time is to do that when the customer, uh, cognitive re- resources are depleted, like right before lunch or right before the end of the day, when yeah, okay, we'll do that for another six months and uh, not uh, not worry about it. What I want to get out here as well is the the steps of this. And, and tell me if I'm right here. I might be totally off base. But to, to, to influence a decision maker in this B2B world primar- primarily, do you have to have just ticked all the boxes before you can even have a proper conversation on a deeper level with someone? Is that 
I think you agree that that's the first step. I, but... Yeah, I would say that's general. It obviously depends on the product that you're selling. If you're selling uh, uh, pills, uh, there's probably, uh, you know, meeting detailed specifications isn't particularly important. I mean, you're selling a complicated product uh, where specifications are important. Clearly, uh, you have to be, uh, you have to have all those bases covered first before you can, uh, and that doesn't mean you can't also be employing some of these non-conscious techniques in time. Uh, okay, so, and, so that's what I'm getting at. Is, is it a step-by-step -step process or no, is it no, just an really. amalgamation of everything in one go? Yeah, so let, let me give you another example. Uh, there is uh, something called the ultimatum game. It's a psychology test uh, where uh, a, a researcher uh, has two subjects. Uh, and object is given an amount of money, say $10, and, uh, and, and told that uh, he or she can divide it uh, any way he wants between himself and the other subject. The uh, It could be... Uh, 10 and 0 be 5 and 5, uh, anything in between. Uh, and uh, the second person has the right to accept or reject the offer. If that second person reads the offer, nobody gets any money. Uh, if they accept the offer, both get the amount of money that the researcher promised them. Uh, so uh, it's uh, pretty clear that if you were viewing that from a totally logical standpoint, Point. Uh, any non-zero offer for the person uh, should be accepted because that way, even if the first person kept nine and gave the other person one, one more dollar than the person had yeah. uh, to begin with. Uh, and it's not the way it plays out in the real world, though. Uh, simple are humans and they're emotional beings. They are not uh, economic engines uh, or economic automatons that uh, would say, yes, uh, I've conducted an analysis of this and and dollars better than zero dollars. Uh, when that first person says, "Okay, I'll give you one and keep nine, uh, their immediate reaction is, "Well, you're a jerk, and uh, <laughs> I'm not uh, going to accept the offer, so we both get nothing. I'll take that." And uh, in fact, when this game is played, and it's it's been repeated thousands and thousands of times in different labs around the world, uh, about uh, a third of the deals end in failure. Uh, and when you think about that from a sales standpoint, uh, here's something that uh, in every case really uh, should be completed. There, there's no reason why uh, any deal wouldn't be completed because probably nobody is going to offer a second person because they know that would be rejected. Uh, but in fact, about a third of the time, the second person does reject the first offer. Uh, and uh, only about, uh, uh, I think, uh, half the deals are actually fair, considered fair, which would be four and six, six and four, five and five. Uh, but then uh, the uh, researchers tried a different approach. Uh, they had the people just chat before they even learned about the details of the experiment, chat for 10 minutes before uh, conducting the uh, And when they did that, uh, suddenly uh, over 80% of the deals were fair deals and 95% of the deals were successful. Uh, and, and what that means is, first of all, the first person was more likely to offer a slightly more fair deal uh, and or more, um, uh, you know, a little bit uh, more even split. Uh, and even if this was not fair, uh, the second person under that condition was more, more accepted. Uh, so uh, suddenly you go from uh, only about two thirds of the deal being completed to uh, now 95% uh, of them being completed. And all it took was 10 minutes of social conversation before that. And so, uh, you know, what that uh, means to me is if you're in a sales situation, obviously you want to get down to business and show how your product is to be the person's product, but uh, you should not do that. You should always take uh, an extra uh, few minutes to uh, uh, just chat socially. Probably what's going on, they, the scientists didn't really analyze like the nature of the chat to see what they were talking about. They did not talk about the experiment because they didn't know what the details were at that point. In other words, they couldn't strategize and say, well, hey, mm -hmm. here's my plan. How does that sound to you? Uh, but they probably found something in common. Uh, in other words, uh, office experiments are uh, conducted in universities where if you take two students, they'll probably find something in common, uh, you, know, you know, professors in common, in the class, you know, classes, uh, where they live, uh, something. Uh, and what that, that 
when you can find something that you have in common with the other person, uh, that's what Robert Cialdini uh, uh, invokes, what Robert Cialdini calls the liking effect, uh, where uh, if I find something in common with you, well, then uh, I'm more likely to be persuaded by you to do something. And there's a lot of research on that. Uh, so uh, that's that's more speculation that what's happening is, is this liking effect, but uh, it uh, that is definitely something that a person can do if they're in person or even, even over the phone. If they know something about the person, do that homework. Uh, find out uh, what you might have in common, whether it's uh, where you went to school, a hobby, where you grew up. Uh, you know, there's almost certainly something. Maybe you both own dogs. Uh, you know, there's, uh, but when you can do that, uh, you will uh, be more successful. Okay, so I want to come on to a few real practical ways that we can dive deeper because I think we've, we've talked a lot and you're using brilliant anecdotes to explain it all and it, it's sinking into my head now which means it'll hopefully be uh, understandable for the audience as well as if it gets into my head, it'll get through most people's. But to sum up what we've got so far and I've asked other people this and they've not necessarily agreed. Do you think, and again, a personal question, I guess, but do you, or your personal opinion, do you think that influence, uh, the ability to ne negotiate, the ability to sell, the getting people to have a good gut feeling about you, do you think all this just comes down to, even though there's tactics, even though there's ways to present, even though there's ways to go about it, does it just come down to having good rapport with another person? Uh, certainly that's part of it. Uh, but I wouldn't say that that's something that can't be learned. I think that... Uh, certainly, some people are just more affable. They're more comfortable with other people, and uh, those undoubted those folks undoubtedly will be uh, a little bit more successful out of it than somebody who feels socially awkward and uh, isn't good in meeting new people. But uh, I think that's a skill that can be taught. It's a skill that can be acquired. So, uh, I, and and it's partly it's just experience. You know, mm -hmm. the probably uh, the first sales call you went on wasn't. The most amazing one. Well, there were probably a little bit of awkwardness and didn't start, and uh, but uh, over time, well, it took me about five years to get over that. Yeah, <laughs> you know, over over time, it improves, uh, and you know, you get more comfortable. So, uh, but I think it can probably be accelerated too with some uh, with some appropriate training. Okay, cool. So let's come on to that then. Are there any ways? And you've you've hinted at a couple so far. Are there any ways to get a, a deeper conversation with someone, to get into their subconscious, to be having that uh, rapport built with them, I guess, through uh, whether it's a, a sales pitch? And and what I'm trying to get at here, and this is something I'm really passionate about, and it's something that I never did, and I talked about this at the beginning of the show, something I never did well in medical device sales of because we were never trained on it as well. We had one endoscope, and then the competitor had another one. Ours bent slightly more. Ours is more durable. Theirs was this. Surgeons specifically were happy with all this. That you know, they just want the the piece of equipment that performs the best on piece of paper and feeling in their hand. Mm -hmm. Then when you deal with a procurement officer, they do not care what the surgeon's opinions are, what they've been trained on, uh, what scope bends which way or what. They, the conversation with them is a much more of the amount of rapport that you built, whether they like you. And I guess dealing with this subconscious side of things. So are there any tactics? And I'm hesitant of saying the word tactics because obviously you have to pull it all together. But are there any specific takeaways that the audience can uh, take away from the show that they can use in a meeting to, to test and experiment with some of this perhaps? Well, uh, there are some, some little bit that uh, may help. Uh, and uh, one is uh, a beverage like a, <laughs> a cup of coffee um, if your per person you're speaking with uh, is holding a warm beverage uh, that uh, uh, a tactile warmth feedback will actually translate into to being more warm and there there's actually uh, experiments that have shown this uh, to be true so you have the opportunity to uh, bring uh, your uh, target a nice warm beverage, preferably one without a handle, so they have to sort of cup it in their hand, uh, then uh, that could have a small uh, non-conscious effect on how they perceive you. Uh, another uh, little sort of haptic feedback thing, the weight of something uh, influences uh, its apparent significance. 
So if you deliver a proposal uh, uh, that is uh, physically heavy, then it will seem a little bit uh, weighty, uh, so to speak, uh, than others. And the way uh, experimenters found this to be true through having uh, subjects evaluate resumes. Uh, and they were given a resume either on a heavy clipboard or a light clipboard. And then they were asked, uh, asked uh, to describe candidates and uh, whether they thought they were appropriate for the job. Uh, and the uh, candidates who clipboard uh, were uh, perceived of uh, as being more serious uh, and more suited for the job. So, I mean, these are little things. I, you know, I wouldn't uh, overplay. Uh, they're very subtle effects, but uh, you know sometimes if you are tr you know getting every maybe th this is the one little uh, technique that could push you over the edge. And I uh, but I think that something much more significant would be uh, that establishing um, common interests or things that you have in common, uh, because that liking effect will persist if you're both fans of the same team. Uh, you know that that make uh, all the difference in the world, uh, especially uh, if it's a hot button for that individual. Uh, the, uh, uh, certainly we see that uh, uh, in the uh, states where regional uh, happens and people uh, hire alums of their school preferentially, they will do with alums of their school preferentially. Uh, and a lot of that, I'm sure, uh, is not a conscious uh, thing that, okay, well, I'm going to uh, uh, somehow uh, these people, uh, but there's that effect there that this person just seems my kind of person. Fantastic stuff. Well, Roger, before we wrap up the show and you tell us a little bit about your book, I've got a couple of questions to ask everyone that comes on. So I'm going to throw a couple of these at you. The first one is, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Uh, let's see. Well, can I uh, use Zig Ziglar? Uh, of course. I'm not sure he's... Yeah, okay. Well, uh, I think uh, uh, he is uh, probably um, my sales idol, and, and I often quote him, even though I don't uh, time on uh, But uh, people asked him whether what he was talking about uh, in his books and in his speeches was manipulation. Because uh, really, if you're telling somebody, here's 20 different ways you can close a sale, mm -hmm. uh, and talking about the things that you can say that will trigger the customer to get off the dime and uh, uh, contract, uh, at some point that sounds kind of manipulative. Uh, and the way that was that uh, uh, the uh, most important uh, tool that you have is your own integrity. And what he meant by that, I think, was that if you are working to get your customer to a better place, if you're uh, confident that your product uh, is it's going to work well for that customer, uh, save them money, meet meet their needs, whatever kind of product, uh, then uh, it's if you can help them make a decision, uh, it's manipulation. You're actually helping them get to a better place. Fantastic. And final one for me. I know you're not specifically a salesperson, but I'm sure you'll have an insight to this. We're all salespeople in one sense. Exactly, precisely so. So you'll, you'll, you'll nail this question, I'm sure. If you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at sales? Okay. Well, actually, I did work in sales for a while, and I think that uh, the really simple answer, considering what I talk about, is uh, the non-conscious be to uh, indeed uh, focus on all those uh, emotional, uh, rational, unconscious uh, uh factors that affect your customer's decision-making process. Uh, because when I started off in sales, uh, I was an uh, uh, engineer, and uh, that's probably about as left brain as you can get. Mm -hmm. uh, we prepare these massive proposals uh, that had just reams and reams of specifics and uh, uh, measurements and uh, data. But uh, at that point in my career, I didn't really uh, realize uh, how important those uh, non-conscious factors were, the human factors. Uh, and it, over time, certainly uh, developed that. Uh, you know, I uh, started with the assumption that, well, if my product is better or my price is better, then there's no reason why we shouldn't get the business. And of course, as you know, it's always the case. <laughs> it's interesting because my degree is in chemistry. So again, very analytical. My first sales job was in chemical sales. So I was dealing with analytical people every day, 
Then I took that leap from there into medical device sales. And that's when, again, in hindsight, I never used these ideas uh, well enough. So I think that was a great way to wrap up the show. And Roger, with that, I want you to tell us a little bit about your book, Brainfluence, and uh, share your URL so we can learn more about you as well. Sure. The uh, book uh, title is Brainfluence, uh, and it has a longer subtitle. But really what it is, it's a very accessible guide to uh, marketing and selling to the non-conscious. There's a hundred short chapters, uh, each of which a science-based technique uh, to address your customer and conscious. And I want it to be very easy to understand, uh, although the, the recommendations are based on science. And if you really want to dig in, I've got references for I didn't just come up with this stuff out of thin air, out of my own head, the way uh, certainly a lot of sales books do. You know, as I uh-huh. tell you to. Uh, uh, nevertheless, I wanted to make it uh, really accessible and easy to understand. And also, it's something that can be opened up uh, pretty much at any chapter without having to go through it in a sequential fashion. And I cover all kinds of topics ranging from uh, in person effects, some about to pricing, uh, sometimes uh, very minor differences in the way you present a price, and so on. Uh, so, and uh, to find me online, place to start would be rogerdooley.com. Uh, there I link to my neuromarketing blog, my blog, uh, my books, uh, and my podcast. So uh, a good starting point. And if you want to connect on social media, uh, I am probably easiest to find on Twitter where I am at Roger Dooley. Fantastic stuff. Well, Roger, with that, genuinely appreciate your time today, mate. And thank you for joining us on the Salesman Podcast. Well, it's been fun. And there we have it. Thank you, Roger, for coming on the show. Massively appreciate it, mate. I appreciate the anecdotes. Clearly, you practice what you preach. I always find the anecdotes stay with me, those little stories, and they they find their way into my subconscious. I want to thank you, Sales Nation, for tuning in, as always. And I will speak with you all again tomorrow. 